Odd way to start off a season. We open on what is basically a bunk scene in the vein of the first couple seasons, only Lister and Rimmer appear to be in prison. And yeah, Rimmer's back. An 83-year-old dad? I bet he's not gonna get up in the middle of the night to help give the baby its feet. I'll be pretend to be dead. Darling, can you give the baby his bottle tonight? Lister is in rare form, but Rimmer isn't having any of it. I bet I can make you say something the next minute. Lister is gonna get a reaction if it kills him. I took some money from your purse. It was audible going in there. The wallet that time forgot. Hmm, a Rimmer is cheap joke didn't do it. Remember of on Magruder? <laughs> I used to go out and you know. Before you did. You can have a heel carpet burns, do they? Both cheeks, man. She nearly wore them down to the bone. Uh-oh, Yvonne Magruder. That did it. And you shut up! What you? Have you any idea how irritating you've just been? You're a master. There are things you could teach to tropical skin diseases. So it turns out that Lister did something earlier that severely pissed off Rimmer. You disgusting, rotting, fetid piece of congealed monkey vomit. And best insult goes to Rimmer, as always. 83! <laughs> Time to find out what this was all about. The next scene picks up where season seven left off. Lister is back to normal. Look at me, buddy. There's an invitation that will not cause a stampede. Meanwhile, Kachansky has somehow made time to get her hair done. Also, she randomly stopped wearing red. So now the nanobots are doing to Red Dwarf what they did to Lister. They had overcompensated by making both too big, and after fixing Lister, they are now fixing Red Dwarf. Unfortunately, Starbug just got sucked into a vent, so that's bad news for them. I suggest we move from blue alert to red alert, sir. Let's go all the way up to brown alert. But there's no such thing as brown alert, sir. You won't be saying that in a minute. Ah, new red alert joke. And don't say I didn't alert you. Anyone fancy a game of charades using just your nose, or is this a bad time? Holly is helpful as usual. Pass Epsilon 14 and take a right at the hydro unit. We'll save about two minutes. I don't understand a woman who is hurtling towards 30 and still has a teddy bear called Boo Boo. But when it comes to navigation, there's none finer. I like how the nanobots restored the rats. <laughs> Stay classy, Red Dwarf. I hope we don't get stopped by the cops. They don't like it when you're rat assed. I'll admit it, I didn't get that joke the first time because I'd never heard ratted used to mean drunk. That poor rat. So Red Dwarf continues to shrink around them to the point where Starbug loses its bigger back end. Now the middle section is gone. Now we've lost the midsection in the kitchen. I'm sorry everyone, but we may have to have sandwiches for lunch. Fortunately, Starbuck has made it into the landing bay. It takes a while to lose its momentum, but it eventually stops, and they get out of there as fast as they can. It kind of hurts seeing Starbug blow up. It was basically the Red Dwarf of the last two seasons. Almost feels like they killed off a character. That said, they also brought back some characters. Selby, Chad, is it really you? Apparently the nanobots rebuilt the old crew, so Lister's drinking buddies are back. This is Chen. He works in the kitchen, he's always drunk. And this is Selby, and he's always drunk too. Where's Peterson? Couldn't make it. He's drunk. You'd think they'd have Peterson show up in this scene. I guess he was off filming Harry Potter. Seriously, if you didn't know, the guy who plays Peterson also plays Ron's dad. Mr. Thornton? Unfortunately, Captain Hollister shows up and ruins everything. Lister is arrested for stealing and destroying a star bug without a pilot's license. Do you require any form of aid? Yeah, lemonade and a really large scotch. So Lister is escorted to his quarters, which are very blue now. Not that we're going to be seeing much of it anyway. All right, dude. They don't know about you yet, Hull. Oh, it might be an idea to keep it that way. So the Holly from Starbug shows up, and he suspects that Lister will end up in the tank, which is on floor 13, and apparently only classified personnel know about it. There was an inmate population of 400, all being transported to Adelphi 12. Presumably, they've all been resurrected too. I know the Red Dwarf is a big ship, but I find that a little hard to swallow. Surely some people on the ship have known people who ended up in there. Not to mention that Lister is going to be released after two years. Like, he wasn't going to tell anyone after that? They're all deranged, hairy no-lobers, breath like old nappies, arms like toilet walls, scum of the universe. They're all like that, aren't they? Hang on. I've got one of them on file somewhere. <laughs> oh, no. 
Nigel. Oh, I'm nice. Fun fact about the guy playing Nigel. He was a bank manager who, I guess, got tired of having to look straight-laced all the time. So after he retired, he dyed his hair and got a bunch of facial piercings and tattoos. <laughs> Good on him, I guess. Nigel is lovely. Though he does tend to get a bit narky if you go too close to him with a magnet. Oh, look who's back. I kind of wish the opening scene didn't take place later on. Seeing Rimmer stroll into the room as his first appearance would have been great. Two years without sex? You hope, Rimmer? Words out, they're gonna throw the book at you, Listy. Followed by the bookcase and then the library. Not only is it Rimmer, but it's season one Rimmer. What got into you? You can't fly a Starbug, my laddo. You're a technician, a zero, a nobody. Lister fills him in on what he's missed while being dead. Lister knows that no one will believe him unless he can find the nanobots, but he can't leave the room, so he needs Rimmer's help. A minute, I'll walk through that door. I get enough watches up me Jaxi to light up the whole of Boodle. Well, considering what the future has in store for your Jaxi, a couple of zillion volts is gonna be easy street. Meanwhile, it seems that word about the ship having been rebuilt and stranded in deep space has spread to some of the crew. That is classified information, Karen. Who the hell told you that? Well, the coffee machine on G-Day. At the moment, they can't consult their Holly due to damage by Starbug earlier. You don't believe this one's human. Take a look at this. A little later, the ship's doctor is pointing out some anatomical differences in Cat. Six nipples? I wonder what the female of the species is like. Pretty easy to please in bed. <laughs> his heartbeat's weird too. Instead of a normal heartbeat, his sounds... cooler. Also, his pulse is a different rhythm. I love Captain Hollister bopping to the music. Oh, that's good. Can you sign that down on tape for me? Anyway, naturally, Rimmer doesn't want to help Lister because it would jeopardize his career. See, I'm going places. Up the ziggero, lickety split. Up the ziggero, lickety split, precisely. And now some of Lister's previous shenanigans are brought up. People of honor generally don't take a Polaroid of your snoozing todger, draw a mustache, mouth, and ears on it, and then pin it up on the bulletin board under missing persons. They don't write underneath, have you seen this man believed to be a French movie star? As if your todger with a couple of eyes drawn on it would look like a French movie star. Way too good looking. Anyway, while that was last week for this rimmer, it was years ago for Lister. He's a different person now. I've done stuff. Stuff that make your hair straight. I've come through it. And he thinks he can help Rimmer in return. I've seen the crew's confidential reports. I've seen their strengths and weaknesses. You think you can buy me with promises of power and glory? Do you really think, okay, I'll do it. But Rimmer needs proof first. Get me promoted. You've got it. Okay, deal. You'll find the confidential files in Starbucks cockpit. Meanwhile, Crichton is being evaluated by the ship's psychiatric counselor. Now, you're a robot, aren't you? This guy is hilariously condescending. I was created after you died. I was alive, died, uh, and then started living again. You've been most fortunate, sir. How did I suddenly spring back to life again? You were rebuilt, sir, by these itty-bitty, teeny-weeny, teeny little robots. And they make this little noise. You aren't helping your case, Crichton. He ends up talking about how Lister helped him to break his programming. I've also developed several rudimentary emotions. At the moment, I'm working on ambivalence, which means feeling two opposite, irreconcilable emotions about the same thing. I don't think that's how ambivalence works. As you can see, I haven't quite got the hang of that one yet. I look like a dog with a caramel toffee. In any case, it looks like Crichton is going to be restored to his factory settings. Meanwhile, part of Starbug is still intact, and Rimmer finds the disc Lister told him about, along with... Remember those positive viruses from way back in Season 5? Quarantine, to be specific? Sexual magnetism's a virus? Mm -hmm. Well, get me to a hospital, I'm a terminal case! Holly, what's this? Dave got them years ago from this scientist called Landstrom. Well, bottoms up. Then bottoms down, and hopefully bottoms up again. Thanks, Holly. Loves a bastard. Welcome back, Rimmer. This is the daily report of Captain F. Hollister of the mining ship Red Dwarf. Part two starts off with a recap by Captain Hollister in a similar style as Holly's distress calls from season one. Followed by Rimmer visiting Captain Hollister with an extra long Rimmer salute. Rimmer, is this salute ever gonna end? Do I have time to go for a cup of coffee? Go on vacation? The idea is supposed to be that the longer the salute, the higher the rank of the person being saluted. <laughs> You wanted to see me? 
I'm concerned over some of the safety procedures on boards. So since Rimmer not tightening the drive plate resulted in the radiation leak that killed off the crew, this Rimmer is going the opposite way in proposing drive plate safety protocols. Did you really think of this? Permission to look smug, sir. Permission granted. Along with some extra kissing up. Happy wedding anniversary, sir. Blueberry muffin. Like Martha used to make. But I discovered a couple of unopened medicrates in storage, sir. If this is useful to you in any way, it's yours, no questions asked. Anus Soothe Pile Cream. The easy to apply cream that comes with its own special glove. That's a little awkward, but Captain Hollister doesn't seem to mind. In fact, could you post this for me? Oh, it's addressed to me, sir. I'm giving a supper for some of the guys that I've marked out for greater things. Incidentally, it's black tie. Thai, Chinese, I'll eat anything, sir. <laughs> He's like, hurry and get out of here before I change my mind. Get comfortable, here comes another salute. <laughs> Chris Berry mentioned in the making of video that he played off the audience's reactions. He basically let them decide how long the salute should be. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile... Get undressed. How does that work? And what's he covering? Cue a bunch of gags as the doctor tries to examine Crichton. Which is kind of random since the last guy who talked to Crichton knew he was a robot. I guess protocol must be followed no matter how little sense it makes. Afterwards, Crichton seems depressed. What are you doing here? I've been classified as a woman. Well, because I haven't got a... I'm just not even gonna go into how messed up that is. I do like the detail of Kachansky clutching a stuffed animal since that was referenced in part one. They want my permission to repair my corrupted files tomorrow afternoon. Restore my factory settings. But your corrupted files are what make you you. Boy, Crichton does not deserve how nice Kachansky is being after season seven. Oh. Spin my nipple nuts and send me to Alaska. But yeah, Crichton knows that he's going to be reset to his factory settings. It makes me so... <laughs> Darn it, I still haven't got the hang of that emotion, have I? Ambivalence. <laughs> I like this running gag. I look like Mr. Lister when he's forced to eat fruit. What are you gonna do? Well, I have to go along with them, ma'am. I can't say no, they are my superior. So Kachansky gives him some advice that sounds good. If you get scared tomorrow, just imagine what they look like on the loo. <laughs> do they still seem better than you? No, ma'am. That's what you're gonna do tomorrow, just recreate that picture. <gasps> it works for everyone. Yes. <laughs> Who are you looking at now? You, ma'am. God damn it, Crichton. Sometime later, they all have to answer some questions. You have refused defense assistance, is that right? Not sure why Cat is the ringleader all of a sudden, but it's cute. I've watched a lot of TV shows, and we all huddle together like this and whisper for a while before we answer. It looks like we know what we're doing. We intend to defend ourselves. You see how good that looks? Anyway, they have to agree to getting a mind scan and being drugged, which they do. Please sign the consent forms and seal them into the envelopes provided. Later, Lister is in a holding cell. Operation Get Rimmer Officer Hood Power and Eminence, or GROPE for short, is bang on course. Turns out he gave Rimmer the information about the drive plate. He couldn't have been happier if I'd given him two girls wrestling in a giant vat of baked beans, then removed the girls and handed him a spoon. Ew. I'm on my way. Up the ziggurat lickety split. So Lister wants Rimmer to keep his end of the deal, but Rimmer hasn't actually been promoted yet, so he refuses. No escape No more info. Also, Rimmer doesn't need Lister anymore. Plus, I went through Starbug Salvage, and I found these. Notice how Lister is holding the vials. This gives you sexual magnetism. Right now, Yvonne Magruder is sleeping off the first 23 pages of the Kama Sutra. I wonder if there's any timeline where Yvonne Magruder has any control over who she has sex with. You left some of your luck behind, man. I touched the tube. So Lister managed to get just enough of the luck virus to be able to guess the codes to release himself. Yes. Meanwhile, Crichton is given the choice to go on trial with the rest of his crew or have his corrupted files repaired and set free, worded in such a way that he's supposed to pick the latter. Oh, it's no good. So, he takes them all hostage and... Now, I want you to take down your pants and, and sit on a toilet. And then what are you going to do to us? I'm going to look at you. I never thought of it before, but I like that there's exactly enough stalls for all of them. <laughs> yeah, 
Great thinking there, Kachansky. Now I want you to ask me the question again. Do you want to have your corrupted files repaired? <laughs> no, I didn't. No, no, I don't. The answer is no. Well, that worked about as well as you'd expect. Back to Lister, he and Kachansky are sneaking around and he tells her about using the luck virus. Ah, oh, it's a pity you didn't do the same with the sexual magnetism. Wow, Kachansky is just full of good ideas today. I'm so sorry. I had some sexual magnetism virus on this hand. But the look virus cured it for me. Serves you right, asshole. I don't know what got into me. Nothing, sadly. Okay, that was funny. Back to Crichton again. Hello, I'm the data doctor. If you would like me to examine your heart... I love how it takes a minute for the audience to realize that's Robert Llewellyn. <laughs> if you wish to eradicate these emotions from his database, press fix. I guess this is the guy that Crichton's creator modeled him after. <laughs> so, apparently they actually delete Crichton's emotions and reboot him. My name is Crichton. I am programmed to serve. Notice that his quirky accent is gone and he sounds more like he did in season two. Are you happy, Crichton? I have no understanding of human emotions, ma'am. I am programmed to serve. Excellent. That's a little creepy. Meanwhile, Rimmer has definitely been acquainted with the sexual magnetism virus. Hi. And if we approach light speed, I think we have to be aware we could come across something I believe we'll experience called future echoes. Nice reference. Lister really did fill him in on everything. Let me find out where that coffee is. Oh no, Captain, please allow me. Perhaps uh, you could help me, Mr. Rimmer. Anyway, he's also being acquainted with just about every woman on the ship. Back to Lister again. They've now collected Cat. I knew something was missing in this episode. And they attempt to collect Crichton as well, but, well... Are you addressing me, sir? I don't believe we've had the pleasure. Well, if you'll forgive me, sir, I have my duties to perform. A good day. Even Crichton's walk is different. We've got to get a better disguise. We already got a disguise. What's the point of disguise if you wear it under your normal outfit? You think I'm gonna wear this on the outside? Seriously, I missed Cat. Hey! I got a great idea for a new disguise! The Dibley family! Maybe Kat's been rebooted too. Suddenly he's thrilled about the idea of looking like Dwayne Dibley. I have to admit, Lister and Kachansky look cute with the teeth and hair. What do you guys do? Computer, Computer programmers! programmers. <laughs> Take that, programmers. But then Crichton comes back at the worst time. How peculiar. My mop heads are missing. <laughs> Oh, don't I know you, sir? Or maybe the best, depending on how you look at it. Wayne Wibley. Where do I know you from? I feel I'm about to discover something wonderful. But when I discover it, it will put someone in great danger. And then? I feel two emotions. Two different emotions. I feel... Ambivalence. I can feel my files corrupting their... Oh, yes, that's good. I'm back. And I'm bad, obviously within certain sensible preset parameters. Welcome back, Criters. And Holly gets the guards out of there. Suddenly everything is going really well, as Kachansky points out. Like they always want us to escape. Hey, I was just thinking aloud. But Lister just chalks it up to the luck virus. Meanwhile, Captain Hollister mentions that the psychotropic testing is already happening. Right now, they believe they're escaping, but we just want to observe what they do. So that means that if anyone happens to mention any special agreements. And now Rimmer's worried. Could you excuse me? I think I've left the iron on. Also, he can't stop having sex, so he uh, gives himself a handicap. <laughs> that ought to do it. Maybe too much anesthetic, though. Back to the rest of the crew. Now they're all Dibblies. <laughs> This is just silly. <laughs> Including some Scudders. Also, hey, Scudders are back! Part 3 picks up after Lister and Rimmer were imprisoned again? Anyway, prison life is pretty tough for Rimmer. I was so depressed, I went to see the social worker. Was he any help? Not really, he beat me up. I was so shell-shocked, I went to see the priest and explained everything. What did he say? He said I was a whining baby who was missing his mother. <laughs> then he beat me up too. Also, they're given a blindfold for whenever one of them uses the bathroom. But we're gonna spend the next two years in the brig? 
Two years with the scum of the universe. People so unbalanced and debauched they couldn't even get elected as president of the United States. So not touching that. If only I'd hired a smarter lawyer instead of the brain-dead, pompous, stupid-haired git I ended up with. You defended yourself. <laughs> I think the blindfold's supposed to be for me. That would make more sense, wouldn't it? Now we're going back to where part two left off. If you can't tell, I'm not a fan of the switching back and forth. I'm not really sure why they did that, other than to go, look, the bunk scenes are back. Anyway, another recap of the previous episode from Captain Hollister, only this time he mentions that they've already been drugged and they're in a virtual reality simulation. I also suspect someone, possibly Lister, has given Rimmer access to the crew's confidential files, and he's using this information to blackmail his way up the chain of command. I should know, I use the same method myself to become captain. If the crew discover I'm really just Dennis the Donut Boy, I'm finished. So why did you put that in the report? <laughs> Back to the crew's hallucination. They sneak into a blue midget, but they have to get permission to take off first. Please state your name and clearance code. Major Tom. Yeah, Major Tom. <laughs> yeah, Major Tom. Without takeoff clearance, I can't permit you to fly. Fly? <laughs> I can make this thing dance. Bet you didn't know that Blue Midgets had legs all this time. And here comes one of my favorite cat moments in the series. Though I'll save most of it for the next cat videos. The short version is that Cat impresses the cute ground controller by somehow making the Blue Midgets dance with him. How does no one figure out that this isn't real? You free Saturday? I am now. Anyway, it worked, so they escape Red Dwarf and the Blue Midget. Isn't it funny how they spent two seasons trying to get back to Red Dwarf and now they want to leave it? Meanwhile, Rimmer tries to get to them. Angus Thornton, age 36, middle name Lionel. Once admitted to hospital totally naked and attached to... <laughs> Feel free, stinking, slanderous lie that you just made up. Want all the crew to know? Take a cigarette break, five minutes. Nice one, Rimmer. Back on Blue Midget, it turns out that they're not leaving Red Dwarf for good, they just want to find the nanobots. In any case, Rimmer tries to go in and delete every mention of him. What was that? Something weird just happened. Yeah, I felt it too. There yeah, it was again. Which causes Crichton to realize what's going on. I believe we're in some kind of computer-manipulated, psychotropically induced mind state. It turns out that the drugs that they agreed to take were on the envelope glue. Spoiler, keep in mind that Rimmer licked an envelope too. The crews are innocent. Everything we've said and done. Escaping. Trying to track down the nanos. It corroborates our story. Anyway, they figure out that it's Rimmer doing the editing. And if I ever catch up with him, I'm gonna cut off both his blunt knife. If we're plugged into AR software, there must be a trap door built into the program somewhere to allow escape. The scutter's nodding in agreement. I didn't realize how much I'd missed them. So they look for an exit button and... There's a button here with E11T on it. Cat finds it. 11 is XI in Roman numerals. E X I T. Exit. He got that. I'm not a fan of this claymation sequence. God, they all look so ugly and creepy. There's some food in here, including a bottle of ketchup. Power ketchup, get it? What's to get? Power sauce! If you have to explain the joke, it's not funny. <laughs> Press it. So now they're apparently out of the simulation. Listy, just the man. Now, I know at first glance this may look bad. Also, the sexual magnetism virus is still working. So Lister has him take some of the luck virus to counteract it. Oh god, that's so embarrassing. What now, Rolf? No time to lose. You should head for the nearest one of these. From what I've heard, Norman Lovett didn't appreciate that gag. You mean a moon? Exactly. So now they're gonna try to leave the ship for real and possibly take Rimmer with them. He knows all the security codes. Of course, he wants to stay and become an officer. Look, if I leave, I'm always gonna be a failure. We're giving you a second chance at life and an opportunity for you to screw it up in a new and original way. Holly gets it. <laughs> you'll get your own seat in the cockpit and you'll be in control of at least five buttons. You wake up in the morning and you want to leap out of bed. Well, in your case, Mr. Listischer, that's because your sheets are covered in pointy poppadom shards. Good one, Criters. The old Rimmer was a vital member of the team. He performed essential functions we've never replaced. What did he do? Don't know, really. Rimmer was basically the leader, but of course they don't mention that. I guess none of them would want to admit it. Head of safety. Head of safety. Five buttons. I'm in! So they all sneak into a blue midget again. Different ground controller this time. Please take 
check your name and clearance code. Reality sucks. Your name's reality sucks. <laughs> so they just get the hell out of there. Come back, Mr. Fox! I kind of like her. But it seems that they're in the clear now. <laughs> if I'm so stupid, if I'm computer senile, explain this then. Time for some classic Holly banter. Explain what? You can't, can you? Also, apparently Holly created the nanobots that resurrected the crew. My job is to keep Dave sane. True, I'm not that good at it. <laughs> but I do my best. That's why I create these little diversions to keep him occupied. We could have wound up doing two years in the brig. You still could. And it turns out that they're still in a simulation. In computer jargon, my plans have all gone tits up. I was outthought and outmaneuvered by that other version of me, the one on Red Dwarf. Original charges, all innocent. But it's equally apparent that they use classified information from the crew's confidential files to their own ends. This is where it's revealed when Rimmer was drugged. So instead of the original charge and a possible sentence of two years in the brig, they've been found guilty on another charge and got an entirely different two years in the brig. So they actually would have been fine if they had just waited out the trial. The luck virus. I'll have that. Where's the other one? I'm afraid I lost it, sir. God damn it, Rimmer! I wanted that! Uh, I mean, the lab boys wanted it. Rimmer looks like he's corpsing a little bit. You betrayed us over that confidential file scan. Stole the sexual magnetism virus. Um, I mean, yeah, Rimmer did that stuff, but Lister was the one who told him all about it. The rest is his fault, though. Anyway, they're all sentenced to two years, including Holly, apparently. I buggered this up a bit, haven't I? So, enjoy seeing your favorite characters in jail for a whole season. Welcome to the tank. Meanwhile, Lister gets back at Rimmer. Yikes. This brings up some questions about how the sexual magnetism virus works, but oh well. And so ends back in the red. So, we're up to season eight. You can tell that they were trying to get back to a semi-season one feel with Rimmer being back and the return of the bunk scenes. I didn't get around to mentioning this, but the reason they stopped doing the bunk scenes and why they brought in Crichton in season three is because apparently Craig Charles and Chris Berry weren't getting along and those scenes were getting hard to film. So there ended up being fewer scenes with Rimmer and Lister alone together to make things easier. Whatever is going on between them, they obviously got over it at some point. Bringing back the Red Dwarf crew was a weird choice, though. I think the creators always knew they were going to do something like that in some capacity, but it really kind of kills the general feel of Red Dwarf. The four main characters are supposed to be alone in the universe. Also, I feel like them being imprisoned is unnecessarily bleak. Like, Lister is reunited with his old drinking buddies, whom he was shown missing terribly in the earlier episodes, and then he's just carted off to prison and apparently never sees them again, and that's never really addressed. It's kind of missing the depth that the series used to have. Like I said, they're in a freaking penal colony and it's all just jokey jokes with no weight to it. It's just a little off-putting to me. I think with how season 7 was received, maybe they were afraid of being too focused on drama, so they went the other direction and ended up overcompensating? On the upside, Season 8 is spot on with the comedy for the most part. I laugh at all of the jokes and I generally enjoy it. Though I could do without the implied misogyny, implied rape, and that little borderline transphobic gag. Then again, it was the 90s, so I'll just chalk it up to being a product of its time. In general, the actors make up for any issues I have about this season. They are absolutely on their A-game. And as much as I felt those bunk scenes were out of place, I can't deny that they're hilarious. Also, Captain Hollister is great as always. So I guess that's all I have to say about Back in the Red. Season 8 in general is a mixed bag for me, and Back in the Red is no exception, but it's probably the best of Season 8. We'll see if I change my mind as I continue covering this season. Next up is Cassandra. See you then. Gideon's Bible. He follows me everywhere, that bloke. I was staying in a hotel once. He left his Bible behind there as well. Then two years later, another hotel. Those who get left are behind again. 